Yeah. It seems like that was any of those Anyhow, I enjoyed this presentation.
Kate, you familiar with the fundamental algebraic concepts and what it means to work in a, a different domain and the different types of domains, etc. Okay. And in fact, like obviously you guys know this is uh, the base case of Fermat's last theorem. Fermat's last theorem, actually the way you proved it was, it was actually proved as a corollary. So Wiles was working, he was kind of trying to prove unique factorization for in like a super powered way. And then once he was able to do that, he was like, oh, by the way, this holds for the integers. And by the way, we can actually apply it to this problem. Okay, so I've, I've introduced the adjoint W, but what exactly is that, right? I mean, you guys can clearly see it's a set, right? The set A plus B W, where A and B are integers, but what else? The point of this is really to get you guys clear on the different terminologies. So specifically, the adjoint W is a ring of integers. Now, what is a ring of integers? Well, a ring of integers is arguably one of the most important types of domains in algebraic number theory. And I'll get into what exactly a domain is in a sec, but recall from Finn and Finn and Eugene's presentation that a field extension F, we say B is an extension of F if you know there's a subfield relationship, right? If we have B is a larger set, F is a smaller set, um, and they, they have the same binary operations, we say that that's a field extension. So a ring of integers is it requires the definition of a field extension. So that's what a field extension is. A number field is a finite field extension of the rationals. So Think of it as Q adjoint alpha. Field extension is when you have a subfield relationship. It's a finite field extension if the larger field has a finite basis over the smaller field. And we say it's a number field if it's a finite field extension of the rationals. So, yeah. This is a number field, typically of this form. I mean, you can have multiple alphas, like multiple ones that you're extending it by, but to keep it simple, it's typically for our purposes going to be able to form Q adjoint alpha. That's a number field. Okay. Next, we introduce the notion of algebraic integer. An algebraic integer is just a complex group to mnemonic polynomial with integer coefficients. So x to the n plus a n minus 1 Minus one, etc. Any root of this polynomial, any solution to this equation equals zero, that's an algebraic integer, right? A ring of integers, like z adjoint w, for example, is just the intersection of these two. So take the intersection, that's what a ring of integers is. You have some number field, which is a finite field extension of the rationals and intersect that with all of the algebraic integers, you get a ring of integers, right? So for example, in the, the Z adjoint W case, we know that any element is of the form A plus BW. That is going to be a root of, like, okay, let's say Z equals A plus BW. That's gonna be a root of Z squared minus Q minus B times Z plus a squared plus a b plus b squared. And we don't have to verify it, but any element in this set, any element is of the form a plus bw, it's a root of this polynomial, clearly has integer coefficients, and that intersects the rationals, we get z adjoint w. So z adjoint w is a ring of integers. And I'll, I'll keep you know, reminding you of the definition so that you guys get clear on it, because the, the point of this is to really get you guys familiar with the terms because we don't assume algebra as a prereq for this class. So, yeah. Z adjoint W is a ring of integers. I'll reiterate what those are going forward, but Z adjoint W is also a ring. It's also a uh, integral domain. It's also a unique factorization domain. It's also a Euclidean domain. So what does that mean? That's, that's what we're going to get into. So, 
First, we're going to start by taking a closer look at the integers, z. So, z under addition and multiplication is a commutative unit What does that mean? Basically, uh, a ring is an algebraic structure, which means it's a set equipped with some operations. Uh, in this case, addition and multiplication, and they behave how you'd expect. So, a ring, like for these operations, we have commutativity under addition, we have associativity, distributivity, closure, etc. It behaves how you'd expect. We say it's commutative if uh, multiplication is commutative. And we say a ring is commutative if there's a multiplicative identity. Right? In this case, Z has one as the identity, obviously, so it's a commutative unital ring. In general, a uh, commutative unital ring will have will consist of a set with these two operations, and they behave somewhat similar, but obviously the exact operation is going to be slightly different. So, for example, take, take z to the n, or let, let's look at z squared, right? Now, can, can any of you, thinking about like axioms and divisibility, can any of you immediately see what, okay, what's the main difference between z squared and how it behaves versus the integers? Any ideas? You are able to multiply, so we're defining addition and multiplication piecewise. So, like AD, or sorry, element wise, so AD times CD is just um, AC, DD. That's our multiplication operation, and addition is the same thing element wise. So, it's still a ring, we still have these two operations, albeit slightly differently, but there's actually one other property that makes it a lot different. Think about zero. Okay, so in the integers, if we have a b equals zero, a equals zero, or b equals zero. But in this set, z squared, this ring, we can have one zero times zero one. That's the main difference. That's the, that's the point. We can have two non-zero elements that multiply to equal zero, because in this case, this is this is zero. It's the additive identity, right? Whenever we say zero or one, we're referring to rings. It's additive or multiplicative identity. So the main difference is okay. We can have two non-zero elements that multiply to equal zero, and each of these is called a zero divisor. Well, what, what's the importance of this? Obviously, if we're going to be doing number theory, if we're going to be thinking about division, factorization, primes, etc., we want it to behave fundamentally like the integers. And if we can have two elements that multiply to equal zero, but neither of them is zero, then that's, that's going to cause some issues. So the key point is that, okay, we've seen what a commutative unital ring is, you know, it's a set with addition multiplication, they behave how you'd expect, and we've seen the notion of a zero divisor. We define, we use this to define our first type of domain, which really is gonna be the foundation for the rest of the domains. And that is a integral domain. Integral domain. So an integral domain is just a commutative unit ring with no zero divisors, right? Basically, it, it behaves kind of like the integers, right? Hence the name integral domain. So if we have a commutative unit ring and we, we don't have anything like this, then that's an integral domain. What's an example of that? Obviously, the integers. Integers are actually going to be an example for pretty much every domain. But, okay, what, what's another example? Uh, z, z minus 7, won't fully prove it, but 
that's, that's another example of what's, what's not an example. Okay, we can have uh, Z mod 15. It says we have 5 times 12 equals 60. Convert it to 0. We have two non zero elements multiplied equal to additive identity. So this is not an integral domain. What's another one? Gaussian integers, D point out. Because, I mean, obviously, if we have wt equals zero, these are two complex numbers. I mean, we, we all know that one of them has to be equal to zero, or the right side should be equal to zero. Um, if you, I mean, another way to think about it is, okay, the polar coordinates, the, the radius multiplies, so one of the radiuses has to be zero. So Gaussian integers are another example of an integral domain, and also they're a ring of integers, right? That's why we introduced it earlier. So Gaussian integers are the set, you, you guys know what a Gaussian integer is. So Gaussian integers, any element a plus bi is going to be a solution to this polynomial, right? And you can clearly see this has integer coefficients, Monic, and you take the set of solutions to that polynomial, a plus bi, and they have to be integers, so you intersect that with uh, q joint i, and you get Gaussian integers, which are a ring of integers, right? Because q joint i is a number of fields, and any element in Gaussian is going to be a root of that polynomial. Take the intersection, that's a ring of integers. What, what's the point of an integral? Why are we introducing it? Well, integral domains provide the foundation for all the other domains that we're going to introduce. For you know, the actually yeah, let's let's stick with the the Gaussians. The Gaussians are also a Euclidean domain. are an integral domain, they're also a Euclidean domain. To intuitively, Euclidean domain just means we, we can have the Euclidean algorithm, right? We, we have a division algorithm. But to understand what that means, we have to get more specific. And that, that's kind of going to be the, the general theme of this. It's like, okay, we can reason about how something might be similar in a, in a different set, like multiplication can be piecewise in, in integer vectors. But we need to actually define it because we can look at, you know, five as two minus i, two plus i. Is it still prime? There, there are weird cases like that. So you can kind of understand intuitively it's a space where you have a division algorithm, but we need to define that more clearly. So first, actually let me see what's in here too. So Gaussian integers, we'll keep working with that. Define the form function as a squared plus b squared. We, we don't take the square root because we want it to be integer value. And you know, what are some properties of this? Well, I mean, it's, it's multiplicative. We have Roman WT equals Roman W Roman D. We have that it's positive, it's integer valued. And those are, oh yeah, we also have that norm of A. Norm of D is always less than or equal to norm of W D for W non zero. So that, that's our, our norm function for Gaussian integers. In general, in a Euclidean domain, we call the norm function a Euclidean function. And the point of it is that it allows us to say that. Okay, let's, let's call our domain D for any two for any two elements in our domain. We know that there exists Q and R such that A equals B Q plus R such that R is either equal to zero or norm of R is less than norm of D. So if any of you have taken a number theory class or are familiar with the division algorithm, this is pretty much the same thing, 
except for our domain. The key difference being that we have this norm function telling us that basically the size of the remainder is decreasing, right? Because in the integers, we're doing the division algorithm, we have two numbers, okay, we clearly see oh, one, one's less than the other, but the notion of size isn't exactly clear when we're working in other spaces. So for Euclidean domain, we need a Euclidean function to tell us that, okay, we can actually do the division algorithm because we can guarantee that uh, our remainder is decreasing as we're doing it. So that's what Euclidean domain is. What's the importance of that? Well, we're working in we're working in a different space. Having a well-defined division algorithm lets us simplify a lot of problems in number theory, like you know, creates common divisor problems, factorization issues, um, dependent consistent with equations. So you have to understand though actually what it means to have a division algorithm in that space. Okay, so you've seen integral domains, Euclidean domains, and Euclidean domains are ideal. Like it'd be great if we have a, a division algorithm in some other set if we're doing a number theory problem, but we don't always have that, right? That's, that's kind of the best case. You can still find, however, domains that have unique factorization. UFD will call it, unique factorization domains. Essentially, yeah, uh, think of it as a domain where we have unique factorization, but you know, this is kind of a recurring theme. We have to explicitly define what that means to make it clear because, yeah, like you could, you have, you have to know exactly what the rules are as far as factorization and prime divisibility, etc. if you're gonna be working in it and if you're gonna be uh, defining it. So first, we define a few notions. So in the unit, we define an associate, and we define a jury. And the reason we do that is because we have to make we have to make it clear what unique factorization is because let's let's do another example. You could take let's say let's say 120 right in the integers 120 equals uh, three times 40 or two cubed times five times eight right this is the prime factorization. This is the integers we're all familiar with. However, okay, what if I say times one, right? Times one, times negative one, times negative one. In the integers, we take it for granted. Like, oh yeah, obviously we don't include one, we don't include negative one, but we need to formalize that notion for larger sets. So that's what a unit is. A unit is essentially, you can think of it as like a one or a negative one, right? A unit is just, element that has multiplicative inverse within the set. So uh, negative one and one are units in the integers. Uh, in, in Z mod seven, we, we have two as a unit because two times four we turn to eight equals one. So two is a unit, four is a unit. Basically, the unit has a multiplicative inverse, so Kind of think of it as a one or a negative one, and it doesn't really count in the factorization. An associate basically kind of the same thing, basically just means it, two elements differ by multiplication by a unit. So uh, in this case, we can say three and six in Z mod seven are associates because six equals three times two. Two is a unit, right? Because two times four equals eight equals one. So Six and three are associates. And we can kind of think of that as like in, in the integers. If you have something like, okay, if you have seven, it's equal to negative one times uh, negative seven, but I mean, negative one is a, a unit, so it's, it's like kind of the same thing. Now, what are, what are our primes, right? We want to do factorization, we need to have a notion of Prime. Okay, what are we factoring it into? 
That's when the gear new school is. So gear new school just means, okay, if P equals A B, then if it's gear new school, then either A or B is the unit, right? And the integers, okay, the seven is the prime because if you factor it, if you well, if you factor it in any way, one of the elements has to be a unit, right? One is unit, A, one is unit, etc. So gear new school, just think of it as a prime. But formal definition is uh, if you factor it, one of the elements, one of the divisors has to be a unit. So formal definition, UFD is just an integral domain where every non-zero, non-unit element, so every like regular element, can be factored uniquely as a product of irreducible primes up to multiplication by a unit. So Basically, you can write it as a product of Michaelis' primes, but if you multiply it by like one or negative one, the analogous version, it's not a different factorization. And the reason I introduced the notion of an associate is because sometimes in the definition you'll you'll see associates as well. You'll see it stated as okay, up to associates and order, but that that just means the same thing. So you can write it as primes, irreducibles, but multiplying it by units doesn't change. So that's what the unique factorization domain is, and the unique factorization domain is an integral. So, so far we've covered rings, which operation um, set with two binary operations, addition and multiplication. Integral domains behave kind of like the integers. Uh, Euclidean domains have a division algorithm, unique factorization domain, we have unique factorization. What's, what's an example of a UFD? Um, Gaussians, or not Gaussians, um, integers are UFD. Um, what's the counter example? Z to join root root 5 equals, um, or not equals, because we can say 6 is equal to 2 times 3, also equal to 1 plus square root negative 5. 1 minus square root negative 5. We've written 6 in two different ways. Neither of these factor pairs differs by multiplication by a unit. If we could say that, oh yeah, we're just multiplying one by a unit, get the other one, then it's fundamentally the same. But since that's not the case, these are two different factorizations, so z to join root negative 5 is not a UFD. Oh, yeah. And by the way, to Reinforce the notion of rings of integers. Uh, Z joined root of negative 5 is a uh, ring of integers because it's the set, uh, you guys know what the set is, A plus B, root negative 5, A and B integers. But this is the intersection of Q, to join root negative 5, and the algebraic integers. So any element in this set is going to be a root of uh, x minus a plus b square root of 5 times x minus a minus b square root of 5. Uh, when, you, when you write this out, you get a monic polynomial with integer coefficients. Every element a plus b root negative 5 is going to be a root of this polynomial. You take that intersection with the field extension of the rationals, and you get this. So this is a ring of integers, but not a UFD. Okay. Awesome. So you covered all the all the domains. I'm not gonna I'm not gonna throw any more terms at you, but you still need to understand the relationships between each of these domains. So first, we start with. Um, start with the Euclidean domain. We have a Euclidean domain that implies that we have a unique factorization. I'm not going to go into the proof, but you can think about it as okay, we, in a Euclidean domain, we have a notion of the division algorithm, and that means that we can. You know, we can use a division algorithm, and we know that it has to terminate because uh, our norm function tells us that 
and each step your rate is going to decrease. So we know it's going to terminate, so we know we have a factorization. And then using induction, you can show that you can show that there's uniqueness to show this relation, but um, I'm not going to go to the fold group. This is a fold group. You can do it with straight number theory, or you can do it with ideals, but I'm not going to use ideals because, however, the converse is not true. The UFD does not imply Euclidean domain. Right? Um, a common example of this is C join 1 plus square root negative 19 over 2. Right? This is clearly a this is clearly a integral domain. We have unity and commutativity and everything else, but we don't have a division algorithm. I'm not going to go into the proof because basically, yeah, there, there's no known Euclidean function for this, and the full proof involves uh, Dedekind domain structures, which we're not going to use. But basically, just know that, okay, we have Euclidean domain, and implies UFD, converse is not true. So, to recap the domain so far, we have rings, and then we have special types of rings, like integral domains, Euclidean domains, uh, unique factorization domains, and fields. Now, can, can any of you tell me the subtyping relationship between those different domains? So, like, we, for example, we I, I just showed that uh, Euclidean domain implies UFD. So we know that if we have Euclidean domain, we know it's UFD. And so you can say that, okay, UFDs are the larger version and Euclidean domains are a subset of that. And throughout, I've technically shown each of the subtyping relationships, but I don't know, has anyone like followed that? Or? Okay, I'll, I'll write it up. So we have rings, specifically, or yeah, we have rings, which are a set Set R with binary operations, addition and multiplication. Sometimes it's literally addition and multiplication, sometimes it's an analog. Uh, then we have integral domains. Basically, those are rings that are commutative and they have a unity, but there are no, no zero factors. Right? We saw, we saw um, D squared, it's not an example of this because it doesn't zero. Next, we have UFDs, right? Unique factorization domains. Then we have Euclidean domains. And then I haven't mentioned fields, but I'm sure some of you guys, I, you, you guys know the fields. So next, we have fields where really we have all the properties we want. So summarize rings set with addition and multiplication that we have kind of you'd expect. Integral domains behave like the integers because there are no zero divisors. UFDs, just think of it as having unique factorization. Euclidean domains, uh, division algorithm. And think of fields as being you know, very, very nice fields. We have a lot of nice properties. The main difference is that uh, for multiplication, every element has a multiplicative matrix. So this is the subtyping relationship. Now, hopefully, I, I know I talked a lot about the different uh, definitions specifically, but hopefully you guys have like an intuitive sense of the differences between each of these types of domains. So, is that, is that the case? Yeah, thumbs up. <laughs> yeah, so, yeah, just rings, it's, a, it's just a set, we have two operations, Additional multiplication to give how you expect. Integral domain behaves like the integers. UFD, we can factorize things uniquely. Euclidean domain, we have division algorithm fields. We kind of have all the properties you'd want. Like they're very similar to the integers. Alright. Also, yeah, rings of integers are uh, arguably one of the most important types of domains for algebraic number theory. And Technically, they're a integral domain, but the reason they're so important is because they're often the map 
your choice for solving the problem. So to recap, to revisit our original example, we had we had some equation in the integers, but we I mean the natural approach is to try and factor it. So we say x plus y times x squared minus xy plus y squared, and we factored it as much as we could in the integers, but from there it's not clear. However, we are able to, if we switch to a new space, if we switch to the space z adjoining w, we can factor it further. x plus y, x plus wy, x plus w squared y. We can factor it further, and then therefore make further progress on the problem, but we have to switch to this new space. And the, the example was that, okay, we showed that each of these are relatively prime, Obviously, they have to divide um, the right side, so each of them has to be a cube. Then you can set up a system of equations, and you're able to get a contradiction. I'm not going to fully go into that, but the point is, is that sometimes you're working in the integers, and then you want to switch to a larger space, like z adjoining w, because that lets you, uh, you know, factor it further. Pretty much. But the point is, is that if you're going to work in that larger space, you have to understand the rules and the properties of that space. Like th this is a whole field of study, knowing the difference between a ring and integral domain, the UMC, et cetera, and the different properties of each of them and what that implies. So the point is, is that you can work in a different space, but you have to fundamentally understand the core properties of that space. And oftentimes, like for this specific problem, for, for mass less than, for x to the p plus y to the p, equals z to the p, the natural choice is to work in z to join, and to know wp is, uh, wp is the p group of unity, so the natural choice is, you know, like, okay, here we, we work in w3. The natural choice is to work in z adjoining wp, because then you can factor similarly, you can kind of play around with things, you can get new insights into the problem. And interestingly enough, uh, P equals 37 is actually the first case where this type of approach fundamentally fails. So, you know, you can't always just like work in a different space or, you know, go to the complex plane and say, okay, now, now we can factor further, now it's going to work. Because P equals 37, the first case where unique factorization fundamentally fails and you can't really pursue this approach. But you still need to know what these different types of domains are because this gives you more insight into the problem. And actually, what you can do is, this is, yeah, we'll, we'll mention it. So I, have, I haven't introduced ideals, but think of, as an, think of an ideal as a way to partition a set. So each of these is a set with some operations, right? It's a set R and then we have an operation with different properties. If you have a set R, Think of an ideal as one equivalence class for that set. Like you can, you can partition a set into a bunch of different equivalence classes. Think of an ideal as one of those equivalence classes. Now, the point of this is that if you partition the set into the different ideals, and there's only one ideal, only one equivalence class, then we have unique factorization. If there are multiple, then we don't have unique factorization. And the Class number. class number tells us basically the number of ideals when we partition a set in this way. And basically it tells us how much unique factorization fails by. Right? Because if we can partition a set and have only one uh, equivalence class, we know we have unique factorization. If we have 100, the, the class number is 100 because it's, it's a notion of how much we fail by. But that's what you do when you don't have unique factorization, so for, for p equals 37. But even, even if you don't have unique factorization, you still need to understand the difference between these different types of domains because other approaches, like looking at class numbers, will involve ideals and things of that nature, which is a, a subtype of one of these, which we haven't gone into. But yeah, the Basically, the, the general point, the general takeaway is that sometimes you're working in the integers, 
or some other space, but you want to work in a larger space or some other set, if you're gonna do so, you need to fundamentally understand the properties and relationships of that set and what type of domain it is, because if you know what type of domain it is, there's a ton of theory behind it that will give you insights into the problem. And even if it's not you know, the best type, like even if it's not a unique factorization domain, you still can use that knowledge to pursue other approaches, like uh, other classes or something. So overall, the, the point is, is that um, I hope that if you're working on some sort of number theory problem and you're stuck in the integers and you're not really making a lot of progress, at least consider working in a larger space and abstracting it. And if you're gonna do so, you need to understand, okay, what type of domain am I actually working in? and fundamentally, what are the properties of that domain. So, just to recap, uh, rings are a set with addition multiplication, integral domains, the haze like the integers, no zero divisors, UFD, we have unique factorization, Euclidean domain, we have a division algorithm, and a field is you know, kind of every property we want. Rings of integers are often the natural choice because they're often gonna look like, you know, Z adjoins something, like, to join alpha, and that's often going to be a natural choice if we have like something to the alpha power. And it's important to know what a ring of integers is, and also that it's an integral domain, so that you can compare it to the different types of domains and what that might entail. So, yeah, next time you're working on a number theory problem, try and think about okay, can I abstract this to some larger space, work in some larger domain? If so, you have to understand what the properties are, and hopefully uh, you guys at least have an intuitive understanding of what each of the major types of domains are. Do you guys like at least like generally understand what each of these is? I have a quick question about the norm function, the yeah. function that we defined. Yeah. Um, but first of all, how is it defined? Um, so norm functions specifically, yeah, so the norm function, which is for a Euclidean domain, you can think of it as, like, we call it a Euclidean function, but basically just norm function, Euclidean function, same thing. Uh, it's defined as some function, we'll call it n, some function n from, we'll say our, our domain is e, so the set we're working in is e. The norm function is a function from e, to the natural numbers, so it has to be positive in integer value, and the key properties are that uh, for, okay, so for b, one equal to zero, we have norm of a less than or equal to norm of a b. So basically as we're multiplying two numbers together, the notion of size increases, so uh, yeah, for non-zero b, norm of a product is going to be greater than or equal to the norm of one of the factors. That's the first property. Second property is that for any two elements in the domain, we know that uh, again for b not equal to zero, there exists human r such that uh, a is equal to b cubed plus r with, and this is the important part, with either r equal to zero or uh, norm of r less than norm of p. So basically it's an, an abstraction of the division algorithm because we need a norm function that behaves fundamentally similar if it maps to integers. Uh, another property is that like norm of a b equals As you're multiplying an element by another, this notion of size has to at least increase or stay the same. And we can do the division algorithm, and we need the norm function to have a notion of size so that the remainder is decreasing, so that it eventually eliminates. Okay, is the zero property a uh, part of the definition? Or is it it's, no, it's not. Yeah. Um, these are the really the main parts. Uh, for the Gaussian integers, this obviously holds, and I'm pretty sure in general it holds, but these are really the Thank you.
more and more to the simple ones that we make that we don't like. Yeah. Okay. Usually there's like one main one that is the standard that usually we work with. Like in the Gaussian, everyone uses a square plus b squared. But yeah, I'm sure there are, there are some types of commands where there will be multiple right. that functions here. Yeah. Um, so you were talking about how the people can send this to small transformers. So what do you mean exactly the concerning thing that works? Where yeah, where it's like fundamentally broken. Yeah. Like I just wanted to know like what's the intuition? Like why are you sending this? Like it seems kind of arbitrary. Uh I I asked, um oh yeah, by the way, I should mention thank you to Luke and Professor Ramakrishna for uh, Luke helped me I guess, come up with the outline and the general idea for the talk, and Professor Ramakrishna helped me come up with this as the motivating example to kind of bring everything full circle, and he really helped guide the narrative. But yeah, I, I asked him that. Um, his response was like, it's, it's complicated. <laughs> <laughs> and it's actually, this isn't actually the first case where unique factorization fails. There are other keys less than uh, 37 where it, it fails, but this is the case where it, it fails like so badly that you you can't do anything. And that's the notion of the class number because that kind of tells us how badly unique factorization fails by, like how many different factorizations do we have. So P equals 37 is the first case where it's like really kind of, you have to pursue it. But as far as why exactly, it's, it's complicated. Any other questions? Is, is this, uh, the only difference between uh, AD and K is that the division is fairly traditional? Uh, no. So we actually, for all of these, like for a ring, like for all of these, we have commutativity and multiplication uh, because we defined an integral domain as a commutative unital ring, whereas a regular ring, you know, we just have these two operations, but we don't have commutativity uh, for multiplication. If we have commutativity for multiplication and we have uh, it's unital and we have a one, then that's an integral domain. So then all of these are also integral domains and so the main, the main difference for fields is that fields have multiplicative inverses. Okay. So like the, 